It is so good to be with you guys today. I, uh, I enjoy your banter before the service. This is a church that loves each other and has relationships with one another. And that is what it takes to be a great church. And Zion qualifies. It's a joy to be home here today at Zion for the 135th year celebration. Carrie sends her regards. My wife, she wanted to be with us, but she's felt kind of feverish for a couple days, not really feeling good. And she said, I could go, but I don't want to pass this on to anybody over there. And so she said, tell everybody congratulations, and I'm sorry I can't be with them. 135 years of being a light on a hill. We're going to do some looking back today and celebrate the faithful work of so many here at the Zion Church over the years. I love history. I used to get A's in history in school. I loved it. I love studying it. History is so important. Looking back is so important. It can sometimes reorient you in the present and help you plan well for the future if you understand the past. But we must recognize today that history is never static. It's always moving forward to somewhere. In a way, we are always making history with our lives, with our deeds. What we are doing today in, is history in the making, in a way. That's why we can look back, but we should be wary, I think, of looking back too much or for too long. To illustrate this, I brought with me one of my flickers of faith, as we called them at the Crossroads Church. These are usually scenes out of movies that have a teachable moment in them or a God moment. They're like parables that Jesus used to get a discussion started. You see, um, Hollywood often asks the right questions. They just don't have a clue what the answer is. And we know the answer. The answer is Jesus. It's provided by the community called the church. It's the truth of scripture. So this flicker of faith comes from a movie called Wild Hogs. <laughs> and, and no, for you that don't watch movies, this is not a hunting scene. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not a, by now you know it's not a hunting story. Wild Hogs. Uh, it's the fictional and comical story of four aging males having a midlife crisis. And they decide to get some zest back into their humdrum lives by taking a cross-country journey on motorcycles. And they decide to call their little gang the Wild Hogs. In this scene, they are starting their trip out with enthusiasm. But their joy is soon tempered by the realities of life and the laws of physics. <laughs> Let's run that, please.
back there. I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> was that a surprise? <laughs> By the way, he did recover and made the whole trip, so that's the way it is in Hollywood. That would have killed most of us. Actually. Let me use this to focus on the point today. I love history. History is important. Looking back is important. But as you can see, if you look back too much, the outcome can be painful because you risk running into things that are out ahead of you. Or as my dad taught me on the farm north of here when I was learning to plow, son, you got to look back every so often to see how it's going. But if you look back too long, you can't plow straight. And he was right. We want to plow straight. We don't want to be running into stuff that's out there ahead of us. And what's out there ahead of us are the present and the future. So today as we glance over our shoulders at the past, I, as we check our rearview mirrors a bit, we acknowledge that things go better in the long run when we remember that our main focus is what's out in front of us as our calling as believers in Christ. But let's start with celebrating some history. I've said that history is important. Why? Well, for one thing, there is no one here today that was alive 135 years ago. And all we have to go on are the historical records. Things that people wrote down, they passed down in stories. If we didn't have those, we wouldn't have history. But I would suggest that Zion is here today because the majority of its history, when you look back, was good. Not perfect. All of you know that. But good. Life is the sum total of our decisions. You young people, good and bad, our life will be the sum total of our decisions starting even now. And the decisions that were made in the past have had an overall positive effect on the present of this church. This church is still here and vital predominantly because of what you are doing today and planning for next year. And the present behavior and those future plans are often rooted in a historical pattern of good decision making in the past. So with looking ahead in mind, I want to challenge us all this morning to visit the past. But do not settle there. Look back, but not for too long. Learn from the past but don't find yourself longing for it. We would be wise to spend the majority of our time and energy looking ahead or we'll be prone to crashing into the present because we're too focused on our past to, and we ignore the obstacles of the future. They're all connected. We'll see that today. But first, this morning, let's acknowledge that looking back is a wise and godly thing. It is. Why would I think so? Because God thinks so. Many of God's words in Scripture are encouragements for people to look back and to learn from history. Deuteronomy 32.7 is one of those. God says to his people, remember the days of old. Consider the generations long past. Ask your father and he will tell you. Your elders and they will explain to you. This is God calling his people to remember those great leaders and those lessons of the past. They have something valuable to say to you and to contribute to your life today. The same is true here. But God doesn't always tell his people just to look back at the positive. He calls them to remember the mistakes and hopefully not to repeat them. Jeremiah 11.10 they have returned to the sins of their ancestors who refused to listen to my words. So God calls us to remember both our wise decisions and our wrong decisions. 
For if we are unwilling to learn from our past, we are doomed to repeat the same mistakes over. Twelve-step circles have a great saying. Insanity is repeating the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And I know people who do that all the time. We are doomed to repeat mistakes if we do not learn from them. If one looks at the fate of the polytheistic and pagan cultures of our past, why would a nation or a church choose to repeat those mistakes? But yet we see this happening. Because we failed to learn from history, that's why. In fact, if we don't like our history, we rewrite it. That's stupid. And uh, in my days as a pastor over at Crossroads, I didn't end up doing a lot of counseling because I had this sign in my office and after about five minutes of listening to someone tell me all the dumb things they'd been doing, I just pointed at it. The sign said, stupid should hurt. (laughs) Because you see, pain is one of the things that causes us to change our behavior. You stick your hand in a fire, you probably only do it once. So when we are hurt, we change. And it's not just the Old Testament that encourages us to remember the past. The New Testament agrees. Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Throughout Scripture, God often appeals to the past to help us shape the present and the future. And perhaps the grandest of all past events that shapes our present today as Christians is what the Jews call Passover. Every year they were to remember that great day, that tragic day. And Jesus adapted this for his followers into what we call the Lord's Supper. And from those familiar con- Communion verses in 1 Corinthians 11. Here's what it says. For I received the Lord from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Look back and remember what I've done for you. Looking back is both beneficial and biblical. Knowing our past enriches our future. So what could we remember of Zion's history today? Well, a lot. But for one thing, Zion has always been a sending church. One year, one year after this church was planted and built right here on this hill, they sent out their first missionary. Noah Zook was called in 1888 to be a traveling missionary for the Brethren in Christ. And he went. And remember, in those days, travel wasn't nice like it is now. He was called to take the gospel to places where the church had no presence. And he did. Years before, the Brethren in Christ had an official missions program. Four of Noah Zook's children became missionaries to India and southern Rhodesia. All of them died on the mission field. Four. Noah Zook and Zion became one of the early proponents of a mission project in Chicago, promoting it at General Conference several times before it was finally accepted. Zion was among the first to openly lift up the value of sisters in the work of spreading the gospel, which inspired a Kansas Brethren in Christ woman named Sarah Burt to be part of a great work at the Chicago Mission. Now I'm told that for the first time when she went there, She got a band together. They had a drum. And the brothers down here heard about it. And so they sent a delegation up to Chicago to straighten the woman out. (laughs) 
they came back and they reported, we don't know how it works, but people are being saved there in droves. <laughs> Many in Zion's history heard the call to go and were obedient. George Cress, Sarah Zook Cress, Harvey Fry, Emma Fry, Harvey Lady, Naomi Lady, Fanny Longnecker, Mary Engel, Pauline Fry, Martha Mary and Mary Lady, uh, Mary Olive Lady, would follow in the footsteps of their obedient ancestors and go to faraway places. And now more recently in these days, you've sent out Shannon Engel and her family as missionaries. The Bathurst are being uh, sent out as missionaries. This church is a sending church. And it's producing fruit today because of that. When you're obedient, God blesses you. The light shines forth from the place. Zion has been ascending church. It's also always been a nurturing church. God has sent many rookie pastors here. <laughs> it's been their first preaching point. Now, why do you think God did that? Because God knew that they would be nurtured here, not mangled here. And I've seen both. Many of the pastors who got their start here went on to become leaders in the BIC. There are four bishops that have had their roots in this church. That's phenomenal. The number of missionaries and church leaders that have come from and through Zion is exemplary. One of Zion's great strength has been that it's a nurturing church. They nurture those who have been called to ministry. And they've blessed the denomination, the brethren in Christ, with this gift time and time again. Glory to God. Amen. And it's not just pastors and missionaries. Zion was a pioneer in Christian education, Sunday school, which was kind of a radical concept at the turn of the century. <laughs> in fact, the Midwest Conference then, it wasn't called the Midwest, the Kansas church used Sunday schools to plant churches. What a great way to do that. Many solid believers who are serving the Lord in various ways have been nurtured here in this room. In Sunday school, and kids clubs, and small groups, inside the walls of this very room. This is holy ground. This is called a legacy. And it takes time to develop. Zion has a legacy of sanding and nurturing. And third, Zion has remained a light on the hill because it's been an innovative church. You've innovated with your building. You've innovated with your programs. You innovated when you decided to use the parsonage next door for a different use. You've blessed many with the gifts of your hospitality here. You're not afraid to try new things at Zion and new methods. There's a little fear here of being the first to try something different. Things change. And Zion has not been afraid to change with the times. Don't lose that characteristic. You've banned those seven deadly words of the church that often spell the death knell. You know what they are? We've never done it that way before. <laughs> they haven't been heard much in the hallways, in the offices, in the boardrooms of Zion, and I hope they never will be. Amen. And fourth, Zion historically has been a giving church. From the beginning, Zion has been a generous church uh, with his people, with his dollars, with its ministry. Generous people have graced this church, and even in hard and difficult times, Zion people have found a way to be generous. Zion has led the way so many times in giving. God finds ways to bless that. I remember back when I was pastor here in the 80s and the 90s, we, we were going through kind of a rough time, and it seemed like it just was more and more difficult to meet our budget. And I'll never forget the night that uh, Chris Fry, our treasurer, suggested to our board that we ought to change. 
we ought to be giving more to cooperative ministries, which made no sense at all to some of us. Our denominational giving resources. And he suggested 20%. <laughs> and we all swallowed hard, I remember, and the board said, let's pray on that. But the board prayed about it and decided to begin doing that. Giving 20% of our offerings to co cooperative ministries, it's called Common Ministries now, right off the top. Now that may have not made good economic sense. But in the end, the result was that after that, we always had ample supply to meet our needs. Always. I don't recall ever talking about another budget shortfall at Zion after that time when I was pastor here. It was a faith decision that God honored because the church chose to be generous. Zion has been a generous church. You give your talents, your time, your money, and your people to God's work, and that's rooted in your history. Thank God for that. Keep up the good work. Zion has also been a resilient church. A resilient church filled with resilient love. You've endured some difficult times in past years with people, with policies, and you've rebounded stronger than before every time. You see, resiliency always speaks to a need of some kind. Resiliency would not be needed if there were no trials or troubles or imperfections. No church is perfect. There have been hard times, but your resiliency has helped you to stay vital and alive even during those difficult times. Another word for this is perseverance. You hard-headed farmers won't give up. And all you guys that have had roots here, you don't give up easy. And believe me, we need that in our culture today. You don't give up when the church life gets difficult or complicated. You stick with it. Resilience. So that's a, that's a short glance backwards. Do you see how important our past is to our present? Our, our, the roots that feed our present are sunk deep into the soils of the past. Our history matters, and so it is right and good to remind ourselves of who we've been, to celebrate that. It will help us to determine who we are and who we want to become. So what about today? Well, I would argue that just as looking back is wise and godly, living in the present is wise and godly. One of the things that Jesus taught was that we must not give our past too much power over our lives today. And believe me, at the rehab church in Salina, we've seen that past being given too much power over today. Nor should we allow our angst about tomorrow to hinder us in living today. We've got a lot of anxiety in our culture today. That anxiety does not belong in the church. Jesus was not talking here in Matthew 6.34, the verse that you see up there. He wasn't talking about planning for the future. Look at what he says. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Today has enough trouble of its own. He was speaking to the anxiety that we have when we do not trust God like our future was actually in his hands. God speaks to the importance of our todays. He always has. Deuteronomy 440. Keep his decrees and commands which I am giving you today so that it may go well with you and your children after you may live long in the land of the Lord your God gives you for all time. In, in other words, God's saying, look, obey me today, worry about today, and your tomorrow will take care of itself. What we do today is important because it affects our tomorrow. Obviously, we influence our tomorrows by living in and for Christ Jesus today. We do not let the fear of the future and the mistakes of our past cripple us as newborn, reborn believers. You've been reborn. 
God says it again in Deuteronomy 30, 16, For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to Him, to keep His commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. Today, believe God. Many of our future blessings are rooted in these present decisions and behaviors. The ones you're making today will affect your tomorrow. So, so what is God saying to the Zion church today? I, I think he would encourage you to keep evangelizing and keep discipling. I think he would draw our attention to 2 Corinthians 6.2 where God says, At just the right time I heard you. On the day of salvation I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. And so as Pastor Jay said, if you're here today, and as your worship leader said, if you're here today and you do not know Jesus, if you're just celebrating a church history reunion, that's not what the point is. The point is, know Jesus. Know Him personally, intimately. Preach, teach, and witness to the salvation today. To church and individuals, preach, teach. Time is short. We need, we need, the need is immense in this world. Look around you. Death is real. Hell is forever. We cannot love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength if we do not lift his name up in this spiritually dark landscape that we live in. Why are you afraid? Here are the statistics on this nation right now. About 40% of Americans have no church home. None. That's almost 130 million people. That's a pretty good mission field. Another 90 million, or about 30%, are Christians in name only. They say they believe, but they do not live as disciples of Christ. They do not study His Word. They are token Christians. And that means that 220 people, 70% of the total U.S. population are either unchurched or live like unbelievers. And they live right next door to some of you. Only 20% of those ages, 23 through 37, attend church today. 27%. That's our future. The USA is now the fourth largest population of unreached people in the world. Does that shock you? I hope it does. Only India, China, and Malaysia have more unreached people than the USA. In other words, it's difficult to say that we are a Christian nation. We should choke on those words, I think. But many of our unsaved neighbors are not as far away from the kingdom as we think. According to a recent polling, over 60% of the unchurched people in North America, listen to this, they still believe the Bible is the Word of God. That's unreal. 82% say they would accept an invitation to church if it came from a trusted family member or a friend. 80%. Almost 60% said they were open to joining a church if they found a good one. I'd say you qualify. (laughs) But listen to this. 75% of those who are unchurched say they have never been invited to come to church. And perhaps the saddest statistic of all, over 90% of all North American Christians have never led another person to the Lord. And Jesus wept. People, we cannot truly love our neighbor as ourselves if we do not find ways to tell them about the Savior of their souls. We cannot say we obey the commandments when we do not declare that the light of the world has come. Let it shine from your life. Let it come out of your mouths. Let it show in your actions of love. We will have no suitable excuse for not doing so in our present when we stand before God in the future. He has made it plain what our task is 
while we remain here waiting for him to come back for us. Crystal clear. And sometimes I have to remind our denomination of this. Matthew 28, 19, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1, 8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will be. That's not... That's like my mother saying, you will be in my midnight. (laughs) It's not a request. It's not a prophecy unless you say it's a prophecy of doom and you don't do it. (laughs) The fields are ripe for the harvest. We must make Christ's purpose our purpose. And what was his purpose? He spelled it out so clearly. Luke 19.10, the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. So all the other stuff we've been talking about today is just decoration to the main purpose, save the lost. And, 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 and that's it. And Paul the Apostle picked up on this and he made Christ's purpose his purpose like he wants us to do. He said, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I I, I know this may sound like heresy in the church, but he didn't come to start a sewing circle, (laughs) even though the sewing circle's great. He didn't come to start a kid's program. And unless your kid's program leads kids to Jesus, it's just busy work. You could get it at the Y. Church, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and it's our job to help him with that. Are you doing that? The heroes of Zion's past did their job. They went, they witnessed, they evangelized, and you are enjoying the fruits of their labor. It's our turn now, today, in Zion's present, your present. Commit to being a witness for Jesus. Commit to being a disciple maker. Commit to going if you've been called. Stop resisting. Commit to inviting that neighbor to church. Commit to continuing Zion's legacy of being a true light on a hill. And that decision will affect your future. Because just looking back and living in the present, both of them are wise and godly. Looking ahead is also wise and godly. And that's number three. Looking ahead is wise and godly vision. With, with that kind of vision is one way to assure a treasured past and a productive present. My, my past affects my present. And, and what I plan to do tomorrow will affect my today. As well as what I leave behind in the past as a legacy. That's all determined by what I think about the future and what I do today. We are creating even in this room now, what will become our past with our present and future decisions. Our daily living is influenced by what we plan for tomorrow. What are your plans? Looking ahead is crucial to our success in daily living. Just ask the biker on the flicker of faith today. The Proverbs are loaded with verses about wise and godly planning for the future. A person should read those once a year, I think. One of my favorites personally is Proverbs 21.7. The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. I think stupid should hurt should be in the Proverbs, but it's not. What you are envisioning for the future of Zion will be what people talk about in another 135 years, when they celebrate their 235th anniversary on this hill. And guess what? It's pretty unlikely that any of us will be here for that. The only contribution we can make is what we do today and what you plan for tomorrow. And even though Jesus taught that we shouldn't be anxious about our tomorrow, he did teach us that it's wise to plan for the future. You find that in Luke 14, 28 and 30. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? In other words, look into the future, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and he's not able to finish, all who see it will mock him saying, 
This man began to build and was not able to finish. He didn't plan well. He didn't look into the future well. So today we celebrate the past. We hail the importance of living out the gospel in the present. But we also note that looking to the future is one of the ways to assure a better present and a bright future. Never stop dreaming, Zion. Never stop looking ahead and asking the question, how can we contribute to Zion being a great church 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now? How can we ensure that there is a Zion for our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren to attend? How can we do that? In fact, I would contend this morning that what's next is one of the best and healthiest questions a church can ask on a regular basis. It's okay to treasure Zion's past. Never stop asking, though, what's next? And so I close with these two thoughts. First, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Zion, and ha or happy anniversary, whatever you want to call it. It's a great achievement. Did you know, I was in church planning for quite a while, and still am in a way. Almost 90% of all church plantings fail within the first year. You're a survivor. Well done, good and faithful servants. Keep up the good work. And the second thing that I would add is, what's next? I think that's a great, important question. Above all, keep Jesus first, always. And I know as long as Jay's here, Jesus is going to be up there because Jay talks about Jesus a lot. I think you know that. Keep sending, keep nurturing, keep giving, keep innovating, stay resilient, and keep dreaming. We can visit the past, but we must never settle there. Look back, but don't look back for too long. Celebrate the past, stay obedient in the present, plan for the future. Those are the keys. If you do these things, and if the Lord doesn't return first, others will be celebrating here, maybe not in this building, but here on this hill in another 135 years. And remembering what you did back in what they call the old days. <laughs> and that will be a good, good thing. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, the past, present, and future we give to you. Redeem our past. Use it for your glory. Keep us with our eyes on you in the present. And give us faith for the future. And help us, Lord, to continue to ask, what's next? What do we do now, Jesus? In your name we pray.